Well, good morning, everyone. Absolutely thrilled to be here for the first Dimming in Education conference. Over the years, we've done a, a lot of annual conferences since my grandfather founded the Deming Institute in 1993. And what we've always done is a mix of bringing people in from business, from education, and having a conference that will have people from those, those different sectors attending it. And as David Langford and I were talking, we said, you know, it's time for us to do one where we're focused on education, on educators, because there is a crisis in education. And we wanted to build this conference as the first one of a number of different activities that we're going to be doing over the next few years. And so this will really be the first one. And you'll look back in a couple of years and say, wow, we can't fit all these people in the next few conferences into this type of a room because we're already getting interest in when's the next one going to be coming. And it's going to be in Atlanta in 2017. And I'm sorry, 2016. <laughs> Don't want to jump too far ahead. Thank you, David. Uh, so one of the things that my grandfather was challenged with was, what am I going to do at the end of my life? Do I create a consulting practice? Do I create a nonprofit? He decided to create a nonprofit because he didn't want it to just focus on industry on manufacturing. And his last book, The New Economics, was about government, industry, and education. And he knew that as a nonprofit with a broad aim that we had the ability to look at and have an impact on all different sectors, including education. And I came on the Deming Institute board um, back in the early 90s and watched the Institute do a lot of interesting things with my grandfather's philosophy. Do a lot of interesting things where we captured his assets so that we had them available for people to see and to be able to use. I used my grandfather's philosophy throughout my business career to great success. And I had an opportunity when I sold my startup company to say, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? So as I talked to my wife about it, we thought, there's nothing better than being able to give back what my grandfather had given me the opportunity to learn in business. And so that's why now, today, I volunteer full time as the executive director of the W. Edwards Deming Institute, along with my wife, Judy, who's over there taking pictures of me. You ready? <laughs> I won't blink this time. <laughs> Uh, and so we had that opportunity, I've had that opportunity to do that. And as I thought about my grandfather's philosophy within the context of this conference, one of the things that, that comes out is my grandfather saw that common sense was one of the big challenges we had. Common sense management, common sense approach to our problems was only digging us deeper into the pit we were already in. Because we embrace these common sense ideas. We believe those are the ones that work, so we try harder and harder to make them work. And you look back through history, and we believed that the earth was flat. Common sense. It took something different to change that. We believed that the sun revolved around the earth. Again, common sense. And we based so much on that for so many hundreds of years. And the same thing happens in management practice and in education, that common sense. And so what he was about was exploding those common sense ideas and saying, we need to think differently. We need to look at the problem differently. But when things are going OK, does anybody really want to change and do things differently? No, it's kind of hard to do that. So for my grandfather, it was times of crisis 
where things changed, where he had an opportunity to have people look through a different lens, to think differently and say, you know what, I'm going to challenge those common sense ideas and come up with something else. And it happened in 1950 in Japan, where my grandfather had an opportunity to go into an economy that was completely devastated by World War II. They were in a complete crisis. What do we do next? And he said, if you have, follow my ideas, you will build quality products at a low cost, and you will have the world screaming for protection within four years. They laughed at him and said, we have nothing left. How can that happen? It took three years. And what that did was it brought about a crisis in the rest of the world as Japan within two decades rose to be the second largest economic power in the world behind the United States and was coming close to the United States, which put us in a crisis. Because now we had to think about quality, productivity, how could we improve? And it wasn't by using the same common sense ideas. They weren't working any longer. So in 1980, a program aired on June 24th, If Japan Can, Why Can't We?, where producer Claire Crawford Mason explored the idea of what the Japanese were doing and why American industry needed to look at these ideas, to think differently, because they were using common sense practices that were not working any longer. They were falling further and further behind. So at the age of 80, 15 years after most people in the United States had retired, my grandfather was featured on that NBC program in primetime television. I had the great honor to be watching that with him and saw and experienced these management leaders, Don Peterson, chairman, CEO of Ford Motor Company, $1.6 billion loss in 1991. They were about to go out of business. But they were in crisis, so they began to think differently. They brought him in. He helped impact and save Ford Motor Company. Xerox was having the same problem. But there was another area that wasn't getting the attention it needed, and that was education. Have any of you ever heard of America 2000? Fortunately, they haven't. <laughs> America 2000 was the precursor to race to the top, no child left behind, common core. It was signed by all 50 governors and the president. And by the year 2000, every child in the United States was going to be educated. There were going to be no drugs in any of the schools. And I could go on and on and on. They were setting goals, but they didn't have a method to achieve it. And so what happened with my grandfather was he was now into his 90s, and he was working seven days a week to help those who were continuing to come to him. And finally, some educators started to look and say, I am so frustrated with where I'm going, what I'm doing, and things like America 2000, that I need to look at things differently. I'm in either a personal crisis or my organization is in a crisis. My school is in a crisis. My classroom is in a crisis. And Claire Crawford Mason, the same producer of If Japan Can, Why Can't We?, produced another program called Quality or Else. And the parallels are fascinating because it's a three-part series, I believe. And If Japan Can, Why Can't We? was a two-hour program, and it featured my grandfather for about 15 minutes. But those 15 minutes were the 15 minutes that helped change the world in the United States. Quality or Else, at the end of the program, just like my grandfather, featured an educator a young educator who was frustrated with the way things were going. And he was in Sitka, Alaska, and he wanted to change things for his students. He wanted to change things for his school. 
And Claire Crawford Mason found him and did an expose on what this school had done and the impact they had. And the interesting intersection is one of those students who you will see, I'm going to show you the video in just a minute, was Helena, who was here last night, who was here last night, and you will see her. See if you can see her in this video. See if you can figure out which one she is. I looked last night and found But there's also a young teacher, David Langford, who was there, who was committed to breaking those bounds of common sense approach to education and saying we have to look at things differently. We have to do it differently. We can no longer look at these same practices. And there was also a woman who was viewing that program, much like Don Peterson from Ford Motor Company. And her name was Monta Aiken from Leander School District. And she thought the same thing. So that intersection of those three people and unfortunately, Monta's not here with us today, she couldn't make it, really started to change education. And as we moved the Deming Institute further along, I couldn't wait as we expanded our advisory board to start working with David Langford and to say, David, I need your help. I don't know education, and I'm not an educator. I know it's in crisis, and we need your help to help guide the Institute and our efforts. And David graciously did that, along with his wife, Carrie, and has helped guide the Institute's efforts in education, which has ultimately led to this conference and the many things that we're going to be able to do afterwards. And so what I wanted to do in a way of an introduction to David is to this morning share those 10 minutes that were a catalyst for why we're here today and how education is changing because it is absolutely stunning to see some of the schools and to hear some of the teachers who are doing things so differently. And frankly, I only wish I was a student right now being able to go through those schools and those classrooms because it would have been so much fun to have joy in learning again instead of realizing that, Kevin, you're just the middle of the pack and that's where you're always going to be, and don't try to break out of it. That wouldn't happen in these classrooms, and that's what's so cool. So with no further ado, what I'm going to do is play this video, and then I'm going to turn it over to David to kick things off for us. And uh, David will go ahead and explain how we're going to work this. It's not just going to be speaker after speaker standing up. David's going to be the MC throughout this, and we've the stories of these people and how they fit in to the context of addressing common sense education problems and in a way to approach them very, very differently. Sitka, Alaska is home to the only public boarding school in the United States, Mount Edgecombe High. <laughs> Students there study Pacific Rim cultures. In translation, that means essentially how do you do business in Japan? Not geographically, but in the global market, Sitka is a good deal closer to Tokyo than to New York. With the development of advanced communication and transportation facilities, economic interests have replaced geographic ones. Schoolroom practice now could become economic advantage in the future. I am from Tatitlik, Alaska, and I am here today to sell you a product called Bridal Falls Sparkling Water. Can children drink this drink? Yes, it's just carbonated water with flavoring. Aurora was very effective, I thought, in emphasizing the health aspect of the drink. I mean, by the time she was finished, I was ready to buy it. Japanese customers are buying this Alaska salmon from the high school's entrepreneur class. It is prepared, preserved, and packed to meet their requirements. Just in case the students forget, there's a prominent sign to remind them. This is obviously unusual for a high school, but what is most unusual is that Mount Edgecombe, all of it, is following Dr. Deming's continual improvement quality system. Uh, I was, after seven years, I was burnt out in this profession, and that's 
right on the average. I knew that there were specific things that needed to be done within the system to change it to improve quality, but I couldn't make it happen. What we've done in the past is throw money at problems rather than look at the management system of education. Our whole system is preventing quality from happening. The way we evaluate students, the way teachers and administrators work together, the whole thing is set up to prevent top quality from happening. Everybody wants to do a good job. Students want to do a good job. Teachers want to do a good job. Nobody comes into the system wanting to do poor work or poor quality. Mount Edgecombe High School is not a special school. It serves students from all over Alaska. Ordinary students are taught by ordinary teachers. No one here was hand-picked. They are from small towns and they have all the promises and problems of every other group of American teenagers. Right, I think that's the best one we ever had. <laughs> The difference is Langford. At an industrial meeting in Arizona, he heard about quality programs and knew that was the way to go. He studied everything he could find, contacted the quality experts he could, and was enthusiastic to make continuous improvement happen at Mount Edgecombe. He was the only one. I came back and explained it to a lot of people, and they said, that's, that's very interesting, now let's go back to work. And nobody really wanted to get involved, so what I did is started on the root level, and I started with a group of students, and I trained students. And within a year, um, everybody, including management in the organization, suddenly saw a drastic change in those students in the way they talked and worked and their abilities and their ability to want to learn. And that's what made the change. Uh, my whole role as a teacher has changed. Um, I used to before do the research and then I'd present the material to the kids. That was no good. They didn't learn anything. I learned all kinds of, <laughs> I learned all kinds of good information. When they hand in their work, I don't serve as the judge and jury anymore. What I'm looking for is quality. And my job is to come back to them and point out where there is poor quality or where changes need to be made and where they can make improvement. Yeah, continuous improvement's given me a way to surpass my goals by measuring my chart, you know, measuring what I've done in the past and now what I need to do to improve myself to make myself go further in the future. I got it done. Last night. In Kathleen McCrossin's English class, students are studying Homer's Odyssey. Rather than read the epic poem, then take a true-false test, they meet in groups to raise and discuss questions, and they compare modern issues in America to the ones in ancient Greece. And they have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for what they're doing, and that's what makes learning work. If it's somebody else forcing it down your throat, it's never going to work. New students that come into this system kind of go through a shock for a while because they can't quite believe that we could trust people that much. They can't quite believe that we would want them to take that much responsibility for their own ed education. When I first started into this process, I thought statistical analysis was 99% of the process and the human relations was 1%. Since we've been in it for two years, I'm now realizing it's just the opposite. We can teach anybody in a half an hour session how to do simple statistical analysis pro processing, such as Pareto charts and, and control charts and, and those types of things. We can't in a half an hour persuade people to use them. So it takes a long time for people to begin to absorb why they need to begin doing those types of things. Also in human relations involves a whole new focus about working together in teams. It must move into a different position this time. A team of science students built this robot in the hope of making science as interesting as sports. And they did. Yeah! And the crowd goes wild! I think all the schools in the nation should implement this because if not, we're going to be in serious trouble because we're just 160 students up here. There's millions of people down there that are all going to have to get in gear if we're going to make it. It is a good analysis. People everywhere are going to have to get in gear, and the gear is quality. Quality is a new way to think about, organize, and improve what you do. We have shown you successful programs in manufacturing, service, government, hospitals, and even schools. So while we are the first to admit that a quality program is difficult, clearly it is not impossible. Students from Mount Edgecombe High School are often invited to explain the rather difficult concept of quality to other students and to adult industrialists. We were curious how they did it. Do you remember Snow White? Snow White and the New Management System. 
Once upon a time, there was a family in a faraway kingdom. The king, Dr. Deming, was a very business-oriented man. He managed his whole kingdom. Dr. Deming was then called upon by the United States to implement his new management system in Japan. Snow White was then left with her wicked stepmother, Waste. Waste knew that if Snow White implemented quality, she would take over and Waste would be eliminated. The Wicked Witch of Waste sent Snow White into the Forest of Opportunity, where she met four woodland animals named Will, Belief, Wherewithal, and Doing. In order to cause a change in any organization, the animal will explain that people must first want to change. Then Belief chimed in explaining that just wanting to change was not enough. People have to believe that changes can be made. Wherewithal explained that once Will and Belief have worked their magic, it takes statistical analysis and human relations to make the change stick. Then Doing said, once the first three have been completed, things just simply need to be done. Snow White, of course, finds the seven dwarfs at the Seven Dwarfs Mining Company and begins to improve their lives with a quality program. Meanwhile, in the ugly castle of waste, the magic mirror said, Snow White is alive and living in a cottage near a clearing. She is teaching seven dwarfs how to implement quality in their lives. The angry witch grabbed her magic book. She then turned herself into an old lady and contemplated her revenge. The old woman offered Snow White a shiny red apple. As soon as Snow White took a bite of the apple, she fell into a deep sleep of status quo, where things can never improve, they can only stay the same. If you do remember Snow White, you know that she was awakened by a kiss from Prince Charming. The kiss this time comes from the Prince of Commitment. And because of the Prince's commitment and Snow White's quality, together they produced a beautiful daughter and named her Productivity. And the kingdom continually improved forever. However, the moral of the story is, as soon as you reach the point of success, don't get caught biting the apple of status quo. Thank you. There are any number of keys to a quality program, and which one is on whom you ask. Senior management must be involved. That's a key. Training and education are key. Statistical analysis is a key. There is another key that seems difficult for people to accept, even though those who know American film classics should accept it easily. It's called cooperation across the board. Then I'm sure to get a brain, a heart, a home, the nail. Without their close cooperation, no one of them could have reached the Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz alone. Eventually, each got what he or she wanted because each helped the others, and that concern for each other was the wonderful wizard. There is no exact recipe for a quality program. It would be easier if there were. What you can do depends on where you are. If you own a company, you can do quite a bit. If you work in one, you can do less, but you can do something. If you're a parent, you can help with public education. Of course, if you're the school superintendent, you can help even more. The only mistake is in believing that it is out of your hands, that you can do nothing, that one person will not make a difference. David Lankford, a public school teacher, is one person. He made a difference. I'm Lloyd Dobbins. For all the individuals who worked on these programs and made a difference, good night. <laughs> Thank you.